be hopeful. Our focus would be to address IP concerns of stakeholders, students, academicians, researchers, startups, etc., and guide them to attain and enforce their IP rights. We not only hold expertise in law and IP, but our team of professionals give us a better understanding to deal with technical issues in IP. To focus on national and international issues, we are supported with international IP experts as well. You can check out our website www.theippress.com and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn to get the latest updates. Now uh, I would like to welcome our panelists for the days, Ms. Gunjan Parihai and Mr. Srijit Nair. So the first with we like to go ahead with Mrs. Ms. Gunjan. So she is a qualified attorney and a registered patent agent. She has more than two decades of experience. She is the founder and the current managing partner at Zeus IP Advocates, which is highly respected and ranked firm for IP in India. She has been mentioned in various awards and publications as one of the leading IP attorneys in the country. She was also named as the IP Star Woman of the Year in 2019 Legal Era Intellectual Property Awards. She is a co-chair of the INTS India Initiative to collaborate with the Indian government DIPP for the spread of IP awareness. Mr. Srijit Nair is a partner at SC Legals, heading the non-litigation advisory services for fintech and technology startups, such as software as a service, SaaS service. He has extensively worked on contract management, contract drafting and negotiation, has, and has worked on various projects involving re legal research and litigation support. He has handled consumer litigation, criminal, civil cases, and has represented clients before various firms and tribunals. We are glad to have you with us today as our panelist. Now, without any further delay, I would like to invite both the panelists on the virtual stage. As we know, FinTech in literal sense is the technology used in the financial industry, which includes payments, lending tech, investment tech, insure tech, neo banking, FinTech tech, SaaS, and cryptocurrency. So, discuss this in start to today's agenda. So, let me just share my screen with you. Am I audible? Uh, Sushma, this is Shriyat here. I'm sorry. I think I have some technical issues at my end. Just give me two minutes. Am I audible to anyone? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can you see my screen now? No. no. 
So for today's our first agenda is IP and FinTech. <clears throat> Importance of IPR, patents, trademarks, designs, trade secrets and copyright in the FinTech world. So uh, I would like to know the views of our panelists. First, we'll start with Ms. Kunjan. What are her thoughts on this? Thank you, Sushmita. Thank you, Sushmita. Hi. Uh, okay, so my voice my is echoing very I can hear you. I can hear you. Perfect. So when you're doing financial technology, which is fintech, you just have to realize that there are two parts to it. One is the finance part to it, and the other is the tech part to it. So of course the law is going to be applicable for the finance part of it, the tech part of it, and of course there is an overlying um, aspect of intellectual property in your So for let's just start with financials. So when you look at finance, you will have to actually look at what the regulatory authorities are saying, what the RBI is saying about how they are going to be regulating the financial industry. I'm not going to go into that because that's not my area of expertise. But the first thing you need to do is that first you have to first check that what and whether you can do business in a particular area and what are the regulatory uh, compliances that you need to do, what licenses you need to take. For example, if you're going into a banking service, you will read, need a banking license, etc. So then you look at the tech part of it, of how you're marrying the technology to your financial service that you're providing. So, you know, there will be a code written, there will be an app made, there will be a website, there will be pay, uh, payment platforms, etc. So you have to look at those as well. Um, if you're looking at, uh, 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 you know, coding a very proprietary software for yourself uh, to provide these services, then let's, I'm going to park this at this point and then we'll take up this technology part again in uh, intellectual property. Um, now, what are the challenges? So once now let's just say that you've got your licenses and you've got your uh, technology in place and you've got you've got the entire package ready and you're really you're now ready to roll it out to your clients. What are the things that you really need to look at? First, you have to understand the nature of your business. One, you will be asking for a lot of data from your um, potential clients. Uh, this, this will be sensitive data. These could include their credit card numbers, their personal details, etc., which is going to be a, it's almost a necessary thing today if you're going to go into financial transactions. So once you have this data, data privacy laws will kick in. Uh, you have to be very mindful that the data has to be secured. Data cannot be leaked. Data cannot be sold to third party vendors because all of these are offenses under the legal system. So how you are going to be protecting the data of your consumers is going to be key. In case there is ever any leak, the uh, cyber forensic experts can actually tell where the leak was. And it was most probably more often than not, it is because you did not follow the protocol of the security data security measures. You've not taken them and then there are hefty fines for that. So, you know, you don't want to kind of kickstart your business with a problem. So just make sure that data privacy is something that you look at very keenly and you make sure that your data is secure. The second thing that you have to really look at, and it's a huge um, issue with fintech companies, is money laundering. Because there is no way that you can check um, of what the transaction was about, where it came from, or how it is going, etc. And it is going to be very painful um, if you cannot locate a money laundering uh, trail. It's difficult, I understand. Uh, most fintech companies are unable to locate uh, or even identify that uh, particular uh, clients of theirs are using that platform to money launder because you will be transferring money from one platform to another, one bank to another, etc. It's always going to be a problem. However, money laundering is something which is again a very legal. Your liability on it is not as big as your liability on the data privacy would be 
because the government once they kind of uh, identify that a particular entity is money laundering, they will inform you and you will have the opportunity to take it down. So your um, uh, how shall I say that your liability on that is less, but however, you have to be very careful because as you're aware, money laundering generally is an illegal activity. Your consumer is doing the illegal activity and it becomes worse because money laundering is generally goes hand in hand with illegal activities like terrorism or um, smuggling or you know something that costs India or your country in kind as well as revenue to the exchequer. So you have to be very mindful of that. The third thing you have to understand is that because you're holding such serious amounts of data, you are far more. Uh, let me say a lucrative target for cyber attacks. So even if you've taken all your precautions for data privacy, etc., there is a possibility that you will be a very juicy target for uh, cyber attackers to hack your system to get to the data that you are holding. So again, your security, your cyber security needs to be upgraded, needs to be very keenly looked at. You need to be very, very clear of, and at least your due diligence should be complete that should there ever be a forensic investigation, you can say that you have taken appropriate measures. So these are, to my mind, these are the three things that you have to be very careful about because these are, these come with the job. So these issues you are going to face and looking at them early on is going to be important. Uh, it is going to be equally important as you setting up your technology and getting your banking licenses, et cetera, and doing your compliances. It's going to be considered as important as you know, the idea of doing business. Um, other than that, what you really need to understand is that, you know, once this package comes through now, you know, what I've done is really given you the bad news first, that these are the problems you're going to face. So you might as well invest very early on to make sure that this doesn't happen. Because the penalties for it, whether it's fines, whether it's uh, criminal liability, et cetera, are fairly high. You are going to be dealing with uh, people's hard earned money who are going to entrust your platform to make transactions, etc. So be very, very, very careful and I cannot stress that enough. Now coming to the intellectual property part of it. Uh, so one, of course, you're going to. Do this under a trademark, right? So whether you use the word X or Y, to identify your term, which is going to be a source identifier, is your trademark. Now you could have a word mark, you could have a logo with it, you could have, uh, you know, the colors going with your logo, etc. They are all registrable as service marks under the Trademarks Act. And I would think that you want to do this early on. Most clients we feel, and who are startups, generally feel that you know, we are just starting a business. We don't even know whether, um, you know, it's going to take off and uh, registering intellectual property is going to be an expensive thing, which I want to just let you know that it's not very expensive. And if you're going to wait that, you know, once I know that I have proof of concept and I have a consumer base and I know my business is good and up and running, then I'm going to go for IP protection. I think that's a bad, um, um, it, it, it's just not the right way to look at things. Because the moment your business actually takes off, that is when other people will start adopting similar marks, etc. And if you don't have a registration by then, or if you don't have appropriate protection, you are going to have a difficult time with copycats coming up with similar apps and similar trademarks and offering the same service. And they could be eating into or cannibalizing, um, eating into your own profits, etc. And that's not a good option for you. I would think that the day you kind of come down to uh, adopting a trademark. Do take legal advice on what is a good trademark. So for example, I would, you know, a lot of marketing teams kind of give you an advice that why, you know, you're doing a financial service. Why don't you just adopt, say, money save as a trademark? Now I can tell you that money save, while from a marketing perspective is very good, from an IP perspective, it's a really bad trademark because, you know, anybody who's in the financial industry is never going to be uh, disallowed from using the mark 
the term money or save or you know, so it's not a good trademark. Um, I would recommend that you identify a very distinctive, a very uh, strong trademark for your uh, business. Once you do that, once you've got your artwork for logos, colors, you kind of finalize that. Please file an application as soon as possible um, so that you can be early in the queue on the register uh, to register your trademarks. By the time your business actually takes off and you know competitors actually sit up and look at you and say, hey, you know, they're doing a good job. Maybe we can write off uh, on their coattails. You're already registered and you know you have far stronger rights that you can enforce. So that's on the trademark side of it. Now, if you're writing the on the technology part of it, uh, you will be writing software codes. So technically the software codes are copyrightable. So if you have a source code, uh, we could uh, copyright them for you. Uh, what copyright gives you uh, the benefit that other person can't write the exact same code or a similar code or a substantially similar code. Um, but I just want to make it very clear that a person or a competitor can reach an end point by going through another route. So they could actually end up giving the same service and having the same tech, which the technology is going to do the same thing uh, at the end uh, or from the end user perspective, but the code is going to be very different. If that happens, then obviously you can't enforce your own source code, but you know, cheap copycats generally have a tendency to simply, you know, copy the source code and just say that, you know, it's easy. Let's not reinvent the wheel, etc. And then you have a really good case uh, from uh, for stopping them. So I would think that you will need uh, the trademark protection as well as you can consider copyright protection on this. Uh, now the last one comes, which is trade um, patents. Now what happens is that if you are going to be uh, software is generally not patentable in India. However, the clients have used a loophole and a sideway where they marry the software to a hardware and then it becomes patentable. Um, it's such a vast field that it is uh, not possible to give you the nuances of how your technology could be patented at, in this webinar, but uh, please do read about it. There is enough material on the net um, on what is patentable in uh, the technology part. If not, please feel free to reach out to any IP expert and I'm sure he or she will be able to help you and actually identify whether what you're saying and what you've created uh, is patentable or not. If not, and if you are keen to get a patent on it, then they could also advise you on what more to do with your technology and what add-ons you need to put in for me, if, you know, in order to make it patentable. So that's uh, the top three IP protections that you're going to have. Um, other than that, of course, there are residual, which is like trade dress, uh, which also is like technically a trademark. You have trade secrets, which is not protected under the IP laws, but it is under common law that if you have a trade secret, how do you protect it? Again, it's a really big uh, field, but trade secrets can be protected and can be enforced under the law of torts. So I'm happy to talk about it in detail once my uh, colleague has uh, spoken uh, about his uh, uh, what he thinks about the fintech. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was very informative. So now I would like to onboard Mr. Shrijit for the same to give, share his view on the same topic. Thanks, Ushmita. Thank you so much. I think uh, I, I think I'm audible, right? Right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, ma'am just nailed it. She's mentioned everything uh, from my end on this topic. Just two things for uh, entrepreneurs who are already in the fintech space and uh, or people who are looking to come into the fintech space uh, as ma'am rightly mentioned uh, IPR is a very important subject. It's best that you consult a good IPR lawyer before you start uh, the business or if you are already doing business, ensure that you are compliant. Of uh, as uh, she also said that fintech is a very regulated uh, industry right now. It's also one of the most uh, the fastest growing, I would say. And uh, there are a lot many things uh, that we need to know under under fintech. A lot of other laws which are supporting fintech. So 
for young budding lawyers or lawyers who are looking at coming into the fintech space it is vast a uh, lot of things are continuously moving uh, in the last two years i would say uh, rbi has been very active uh, in coming up with new laws uh, new guidelines new regulations the same thing with uh, many other regulators such as sebi who are continuously making changes in the industry and uh, we currently we at least i think in the world india is the industry leader in fintech uh, we have all the tech companies who are supporting other foreign company like foreign countries as well so we are in for a huge huge opportunity here so i think fintech uh, fintech and ip are uh, going a long way from here a long way from here on that's that's it for my answer uh, on this topic yeah thank you shrijit it was very helpful now we'll move forward with second agenda for today so that is is it true that only a small number of law graduates are currently specialized in the fintech law if yes then what is the reason it is due to the less demand from the fintech world for lawyers what is your view on this rich there uh, let so actually i don't think uh, so for young lawyers out there i don't know if you've ever studied a law which is called fintech law right yeah. it's, it's a group of laws uh it's not just one act that you have to refer to it's multiple things there are so many things that you have to look at uh, on an ongoing basis uh ip itself is one subject of it you have common law you have copyright issues you have trademark issues you have trade secret issues you have issues of people siphoning off your business you have issues of uh, data protection uh cross border uh, cross border issues foreign laws so this is why there is currently no specialization in fintech law because it's not just one subject it's not just one act and uh, yes there is a uh, uh, you know uh, there is a very small number of law graduates who are currently specialized in fintech because they've been in fintech industry for a long time they've been there, there for last let's say 20 years since this entire industry has changed and they have learned on the way and because they've learned on the way they are currently called fintech lawyers but I still wouldn't consider myself as an expert uh, in this industry because things are constantly changing. There's a lot of new things. If you go out there, uh, in back in 2002, you didn't have UPI, you didn't have uh, NFT, IMPS transactions. Those came on the way after after Paytm came. After uh, you, you have your prepaid cards that that have come. You have cryptos that are coming coming right now. things are changing rapidly uh, in the it space for fintech and that itself creates a lot of opportunities for and lot of new laws that are yet to come uh, that are yet to be you know things that are yet to be regulated uh, if you if you have anyone is following crypto you have so many things that are move, moving right now uh, you know i think uh, day before yesterday there, there, there was actions taken by the enforcement directorate which is actually a criminal uh, jurisdiction so if you look at a fintech lawyer working in an office he wouldn't know what the enforcement directorate is doing so how do you call yourself a fintech lawyer so obviously uh, there is a very high demand for lawyers in the fintech space but it's not just a lawyer who knows everything it is a group of lawyers uh, or a group of firm uh, firm uh, multiple firms working together in different areas of law and that's why you don't have one person who is an expert in fintech that's it from my answer on this Uh, I yeah, think ma'am. it's very true, and <laughs> I totally agree to this. So, uh, ma'am, what is your view on the same? My view on this is the same as Rijit's that it's very new. Uh, there are actually, you know, anybody who is going to enter the fintech world now is likely to, you know, has. I mean, I think what the requirement for a future fintech lawyer would be a self-motivated learning. because while you will have seniors training you in tax law and banking laws etc it will only be a part of the package you are hoping to provide not to mention you have to be very tech savvy you have to know and you have to have a absolute liking and a motivation to read to learn because every day it changes so for example shrijit mentioned cryptocurrency so you know a few months ago the government has tabled a new uh, law which has not really become a law right now there it's just a draft that they have tabled 
where they are saying that their government is going to now issue uh, cryptocurrency and only then they'll be considered legal and then you can technically deal in them. Currently, cryptocurrency is not legal. You lose money on cryptos, etc. There is no government ruling that's going to safeguard you, etc. So what I'm saying is that if you hope to become a fintech lawyer, you have to be very, very careful that you are up for it because like she just said, it is going to be a package stitched together by 8, 10, 12 laws, including criminal law, IP law, banking law, regulations, tax law, uh, data privacy, etc. And if you have that, you know, in you to actually be able to master all of these to stitch together, uh, you know, uh, something called a fintech lawyer, then yes, uh, it would be great. And once that happens, I can assure you, you will be in demand, but it is a uphill task. And like Shijit said, I agree that it is going to be more. That is, uh, in our opinion, it is going to be more like multiple lawyers uh, specializing in their own fields, coming together and stitching together a strategy for the client. But I'm happy to hope and look at, you know, young people who want to do this and actually master uh, all of these laws to stitch together and so that they are like, they can actually call themselves a holistic fintech lawyer. That was very motivating, ma'am. <laughs> Let's move forward. So the next agenda is um, if we talk about the current scenario, is the demand for fintech specialized lawyers increasing in India? If yes, why so? What do you think about this, ma'am? Like I already answered this, yes, if you can become a fintech lawyer, yes, you will be in demand. Um, you know, the banking industry itself, I believe the uh, UK or the European Union has come out with the first online bank in the sense that they don't have a physical premises. You know, it's uh, it's called, I think, the Atom Bank and it's completely app based and it's providing everything from insurance to mortgages to bank transfers to savings account, everything. And they don't have a physical branch that you could go to. There is never going to be a physical checkbook that you are going to sign, etc. So it's completely online. It's completely virtual. So when something like that picks up. You know, can you imagine the kind of legal implications it would have? And it is coming. Whether you like it or not, I mean, you know, if it's somebody started it and if the idea picks up or something really major happens like bank scams happen online or you know the hackers have a field day with the data etc unless it is completely run down you know while working which i don't see why it should because technology is now so strong that's the future so once you have a completely virtual bank the fintech lawyer is going to you know you are going to be buying insurance you're going to be more getting a taking out a mortgage everything online you're probably never going to walk into a branch i would think it's going to blow up so if you want to ride this wave early on and be the early movers in this i would recommend that it's a very good idea i completely agree with ma'am here uh, uh so people who have been following RBI, they were following about uh, neo banking. So that's the same concept that I'm just said, atom banking in US, neo banking in India. But uh, RBI couldn't actually finalize who is going to be the players for neo bank. Uh, let me just give you a small scenario of what we are facing today, right? Uh, FinTech obviously supporting banks, but we are facing archaic laws in India. Let's say someone sitting in Bihar doing some fraud uh, through a bank in Chennai. Uh, and uh, the money is siphoned off. First, it goes from Chennai Bank to somewhere in Pune, then from from that to Rajasthan, and then from the Rajasthan Bank branch to the Bihar branch. Do you know the current jurisdictional hassles we have that we have to face in criminal law trying to track these people? The cyber crime department might track them online, but uh, with the laws we currently have in India, it's a jurisdictional nightmare. It is 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 tough to actually uh bring these people to justice there's a lot of laws that's working together uh when you when you again uh, I'm, I'm sorry i'm just coming back to crypto but just just that just not not, uh, not that uh, rbi is coming up with the law for crypto you also have fema 
uh, so many issues with fema that's an entirely new subject so it is so interesting uh, uh, to think that in future someone who's experienced it all you know it's very interesting to understand that Shijit, there is some disturbance at your bank. By my end? I'm sorry, just a minute. Is it fine now? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. So yeah, so uh, obviously in the current scenario, you know, there is a huge demand for fintech lawyers, but you don't have a fintech lawyer who's experienced in all the streams. You don't have someone who knows every law or who can handle everything in one go. Uh, so there's no one person and uh, there is a group of lawyers, though obviously right now in the fintech space, the companies are going to multiple people. Uh, uh, and just India as a jurisdiction itself has so many states. You have high courts, Supreme Court, so many different people who are specialized in different subjects. It takes time to get them together to come to a con common consensus. Uh, one discussion for a normal terms and conditions in your app may go on for six months. That's the kind of uh, timeline that fintechs are now looking at because there are so many regulations that have to be followed. You, so when Amazon and Flipkart came here, you never had e-com rules. Now, if you want to start on, now if you're looking at uh, Amazon as a good opportunity, you want to create a market pay, market space, call other sellers to sell from your market. The amount of compliances you have to now follow to just start the business is ten times what Amazon had to do when they came in. So that's that's the kind of law. That's the kind of uh, changes that are happening now. So obviously there's a huge demand, but uh, and this is keep increasing. This will keep increasing because the technology and the way banking is happening is moving so fast uh, and it's 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 actually going leaps and bounds and our laws is not following that at that pace. So when our laws are not following at that pace, then obviously it's not just India. Okay, It's not just India. You have uh, all even even developed countries, UK, US, New Zealand, Australia, all having the same issues. They are all trying to come up and catch up with the technology and the speed at which things are happening. And it's not possible when you're having a government uh, in each of these countries. When it's a democratic government, it's not easy to come up with a law. So this issue is going to be there. There is a high demand, but obviously you will not have one person handling everything. You will have a group of people. That was very informative, Shrijit. So let's move forward. So uh, next agenda is particularly why there is a very rare opportunity for patent grants in payments or in the fintech world. What do you think about this? I've already uh, said that, you know, because it's a software and software is generally just copyrightable. It's not patentable. However, this is not a uh, written in stone because a lot of people, a lot of clients in the fintech world actually marry this and uh, write their patent application in a particular way, which will make it patentable. Uh, like I said, it's too broad a subject and, you know, one can't really say that, you know, you marry your software code and give it on a preloaded cell phone and then suddenly it's patentable. Uh, that would be just, you know, tip of the iceberg. But yes, if you are interested in getting a patent, uh, on your uh, technology do d discuss it with your IP lawyer and he will find ways where you can protect it under pat patent law. So ma'am, I have one more question with this. So is this like uh, the rare opportunity in restricted only limited to India or it is like uh, worldwide? World over. World over. There are some countries who allow software as patents. But, uh, you know, you'll have to again check with your IP lawyer whether it's even a country of interest. Like, so, for example, if I say, hey, you know what? Fiji allows software to be patented. Now, Fiji may not even be your, in, you know, jurisdiction of interest. So it's it's not going to uh, work like this. Uh, you will have to go to your IP lawyer. You will have to say, hey, this is what I created. It doesn't exist in the market. It is novel. It is new. Um, I need to get a patent on it because copyright doesn't cut it for me because people are writing, you know, they make changes in the software code and then copyright I can't enforce because they've changed the soft. It's not identical or similar to my source code, but they're actually doing exactly what I'm doing and they've just reached it in a different way. 
and therefore copyright is out of the window and I can't enforce my copyright. So I definitely need a patent which actually um, protects the end result, right? So when you do the end result uh, kind of comparison with your competitor or, or someone who's copied you, then a patent kicks in. So and therefore, yes, patent law is important and you should talk about it whether you can patent it. India is also a signatory to the patent cooperation treaty. So basically what you can do is that you can file in India and then you get 30 months to check whether you know your business is going to take off and it's a good technology. People you have takers for it and it looks like it's going to take off and it gives you 30 months. That's almost two and a half years to go to other countries and you'll be protected in other countries and 30 year in 30 months you can also find your um, you know, in case there are investors or there are uh, license uh, opportunities in other countries that people are wanting to take. So if you feel that, yes, you can sell your product uh, or, you know, you, you can market it actually in other countries. See if there is any interest. If you think that in the US there's a lot of interest, people want to take this technology from me. Yes, then you can file in, you know, you, it, it, the law gives you 30 months to make that decision. It's not an because patenting is expensive, especially in the Western jurisdictions. So but it gives you time. So that's uh, that's a good uh, option. Should you want to patent it, which I think you should definitely consider and unless and you should patent it unless your IP council says it is not patentable anyway. Thank you, ma'am. Shilil, do you want to share any views on this? So actually, ma'am, ma'am, she's actually take a done. She's the expert on this topic, uh, but I'll just take one point from what she said. Let's say uh, the timeline, right? The timeline is the biggest point here uh, of uh, after you consult your patent lawyer. When will you get the patent? So let's let I'll take it from an entrepreneur's view, right? Uh, let's say I want to start a fintech. Uh, I have a very good idea. I'm meeting my IP lawyers and the first thing the IP lawyer says, yeah, good, come, uh, let's do a patent application. You'll get your patent in two years, right? And then I'm like, okay, so I get my patent in two years, then I'll start my business and then I'm going to make money. So yeah. entrepreneurs who are in fintech space want to start the business now and they want to do the patents on the way. So when when that's the that's the entrepreneur side of the story, right? They want they want to make money now. So what then happens is they to come into the fintech space, and then they get stuck in just making money and not in patenting because half the time they are they're complying with laws. There's new things coming up. There's new new opportunities opening up. So you have the same version running in app. Then the same version running on websites. Then you are tying up with banks. Then you have to do, do other contracts with foreign companies. Then you have compliance uh, audits. Then you, so so all these things they just get stuck. An idea getting patented and coming onto the market takes time. So let's let so I I like to compare this. Okay, right. This is a question which is uh, now very nascent. If you look at fintech, we are talking about fintech is just starting up. The wave is just starting. Let's look at the auto industry. Do you know how many patents have come in the auto industry and when have they come? How many years have they taken? So the company is not actually coming up. Well, Tata's have done a lot of patents in the past three, four years, but it's a running company. They are making profits. They don't have to stop their business to go get a patent. They are getting patent on a running product. So patents are happening. It's not that it's, it's, not that it's a rare opportunity to get patents in uh, fintech, obviously. The topic about getting a patent in India to getting a patent outside India, it's an entirely different topic. Please speak to your IP experts for that. And it all depend on if it's uh, only a software, it's going to be combined with a hardware like ma'am just said. All that topic is entirely different. It's entirely a new point which has to be looked at for each each individual separately. But it is not a rare opportunity, I would say. I'd say there are patents happening, but it's just a very nascent industry for uh, it to be noticed that people are coming out with uh, new patents and then you know uh, that particular uh, option of payment is going to be only for that specific company. Uh, that's a little new for the fintech space. I also want to add here that as Srijit said, you don't have to stop your business. Now patent what happens is that you can't publish it. So it has to be new and novel, 
right? So the day your technology is in place, but before you showcase it or even put it in place and start running your business, your application should be whether it's a provisional application or a final application has to be with the patent office. That doesn't mean that you need to stop your business. Once the application is there and you've got your priority date, you can move on with your business. You can develop, you can sell, you can market, you can start your business. Because a patent doesn't take two years, it'll take more just to get uh, registered. Uh, but patent law says that, you know, for example, you filed an application of 1st of January 2022. You started your business in June 2022. Somebody started copying your patent in, say, December 2022, and you don't have a patent registration so far. You can't really enforce it. Your patent registration may come, you know, may be granted in 2024, but the law allows you to sue the third person for since when he started. So past infringement is also taken into account. And I must say that Indian Patent Office will take longer to grant you a patent than in a Western jurisdiction. They'll be quicker. So, you know, it's just basically just biding your time. Even trademark registration you can file, but you're not likely to get it. Uh, you know, you have a four month opposition period where the trademark office publishes your trademark and throws it open to the public saying that, hey, if anyone has an objection, you let us know in four months. So, you know, there's an examination process, there is an advertisement, there is an opposition process, etc. So even if you have a smooth application, no objections, nothing, it would still take eight to 10 months for you to get a registration certificate, and that's the quickest. But if you have objections uh, and you've not done pre-filing searches and, you know, there are third parties on the register, which the trademark office is citing that you can't get your trademark because Mr. X already has an application for a similar or an identical mark. Then you're looking at, a, I mean, a very fair assessment would be you're looking at three to four years for a trademark registration as well. So, cool. but that should stop you from doing business. All you need to do is just get your application in. True, that's very true. Cool. Thank you, ma'am. So let's move ahead with next. That is IP protection strategies and the role of fintech lawyers. So we already talked about this. So let's just put some light more on this topic. Um, OK, so IP protection strategies again, there are multiple strategies. For example, you are uh, hell bent on or you are invested in taking. I'm, I'm going to give you a very small example. Supposing your marketing team comes up saying that, you know, this is the trademark that you need to have. You like it. You've invested in it. You love it. You want it. The first thing you do is that go and check with your IP lawyer that whether I can even get it. Your IP lawyer is going to conduct searches. They are going to conduct common law searches. They're going to check on the Internet and then they'll give you a green light that, hey, you know, I don't think anybody's in the market with this kind of trademark, whether it's India or abroad. You have to be very mindful. I, this is a point that you must bear in mind that given the nature of your business, which is online, while India is your primary jurisdiction, but you have when you are doing trademark clearances, you also have to look at the foreign uh, jurisdictions because there could be a possibility that someone, for example, let's just look at the word capital, right? Now, capital has a meaning in the financial world. It also has a meaning in a like a capital of a city or whatever. Uh, so now, you know, you like the word capital. We looked at Indian trademark register. We looked at the Internet, very India specific companies. We looked at ROC, uh, the registrar of companies, and we come back and tell you that, hey, you know, uh, nobody in India is using capital for fintech. Please go ahead and adopt it. But that is only half baked because there is a possibility that there is a UK or a US company using the term capital for identical services. And even if they're not in India, they would still have a cause of action in India against you saying that the consumer sitting in India could be fooled that the, your services are somewhere licensed from the US companies, this thing. So they don't have to be in India because India actually works on spillover goodwill and reputation. So when you're doing trademark clearances, especially for your industry, it's not like you're selling socks, right? So, you know, anybody could be selling socks in the US and the Indian consumer wouldn't know. When it is an online business, and especially it's fintech where people's money is involved, etc., 
my personal opinion is that you know trademark clearances have to be global so make sure you tell your ip lawyer from an entrepreneurs or if you are going to become a fintech lawyer make sure that the, at least the ip clearances are worldwide similarly with patents patents is also kind of global so you come up with the technology uh, your ip lawyer is going to do a full uh, global analytics on this global search for it to see whether you know i don't know who i or some US company, Qualcomm, somebody has already filed, thought of this technology and already filed a patent application. That means it's not new, it's not novel, you're not going to get it. Your IP uh, counsel is also going to advise you that, hey, you know, you gave me a patent application which says A, B, and C. I did a search and I believe Qualcomm has already filed an application which, which has A, B, and C. So, you know, this is going not going to go through and you're not going to get a monopoly and a patent on it. So your IP counsel is going to advise you that why don't you add a D or an E and you know make this come out of the purview of the Qualcomm application and then we can file because then we can call it a you know a better version or a new um, invention. So like I said, strategies are a lot and you will need a strategy before uh, you uh, embark on this, especially on the IP side, what is patentable, what is a design, what is everything. You know, your user interface can also be copyrighted, for example. So <coughs> the look and feel, for example. So I would say that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm just giving you the, you know, and a very broad overview that, you know, this can happen, but there are a lot of nuances that you will need to sit down with your IP lawyer and your other lawyers to come up with a holistic strategy on this. And there are lots of strategies, plenty of them uh, to get you what you want, but talk to your lawyer or become that lawyer and that's fine too. <laughs> Very true, ma'am. Shijit, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think uh, so. Let's since it's uh, especially for FinTech, I don't know how many people in this uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know how many people in this uh, group actually have noticed that uh, there's a change in, like ma'am said, the the, uh, the app interface or the website interface can also be, you know, uh, a way of uh, protecting your IP. So how many people have noticed that the uh, that Paytm has changed its interface three times? Uh, Amazon has changed its interface. Face, face, uh, Flipkart has changed its interface. Interface. Uh, Facebook, after it brought in Meta, uh, has literally changed uh, the look and feel of the entire website. Uh, these are all IP strategies. These are all a system of knowing, uh, uh, you know, system of getting customers to know that they are, uh, you know, looking at the correct website or they're looking at the, uh, they're, you know, trying to restrict customers from going into another website. So these are all IP strategies. It might it might not involve a lawyer at that point in time, but that is why they people, you know, end up uh, having litigations. So it's always best to have a lawyer during the IP strategies. And most of most of these strategies are being done by the marketing team and, uh, you know, ongoing fintech companies have had this issue when uh, when they don't involve uh, you know, a lawyer at that stage. So IP protection strategies are important and actually the role of fintech lawyers is a lot uh, when it comes to IP protection. Uh, it's just that, we, we, you know, companies have to understand that. True, that was... Which again, really answers, uh, which again answers your first question that if you're looking to become a fintech lawyer, all the best to you. I can guarantee that there is going to be enough and more business uh, coming your way. But... Just make sure that you are up for it because it is a very broad field. True, ma'am. Thank you for uh, both of your views. That was very detailed and informative. So let's move forward. Next agenda is what is your advice for young lawyers who want to specialize in the field of fintech? I will let Srijit say talk about <laughs> yeah i was just actually laughing because ma'am's what actually covered everything uh you have your work cut out right you start with your basic laws it's 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 uh, a massive amount of laws you have to first learn uh understand 
or you also have to be tech savvy you also have to notice around you what's happening what's new things coming uh it's always best to be in a group as it's, as it's a new field you don't actually have study groups which are discussing topics or uh, you don't have uh, you know foresight of what legislation is going to come uh, what are the new discussions that's going to happen we still have uh, data protection bill uh, which was taken back the new bill is yet to come so many things are changing so many things are constantly changing in the industry new new tech ideas you know uh, the topic is really huge so the advice for young lawyers basically is first uh, notice the changes around you to look at all the laws that are relevant to fintech i would i would from my end i would suggest if you're looking at 15 years in this industry choose one good topic that you're going to specialize in out of fintech laws uh, but you should know about everything else you be a uh, master of all i mean master of one uh, but a jack of all trades right you, you, just, you just have to choose one i i i really can't fathom a uh, a fintech lawyer who knows everything uh, he knows what's running around uh, but he will still need a specialist advice uh, just just i mean just going back you know uh, when you look at a corporate lawyer he is too busy in uh, looking at the existing laws he is looking at compliances he is looking at uh, new regulations in the play he is looking at software issues he is looking at ip uh, like we discussed uh, marketing strategies he is looking at all of this uh if he's looking at all of this who's looking at what the interpretation of high court has been in a specific law what cases have been going on is he is he looking at what supreme court is taking a view in regards to a, sp- a specific uh interpretation of a clause is he looking at what uh, what new zealand court is looking at you know there's a case going against facebook in new zealand a case a case going against uh, uber in us uh, that might change the entire industry that might change the entire ecom space Uh, the amount of things the amount of information people have to be updated with is immense so i my advice is you you be a fintech lawyer be a jack of all trades in fintech law but you be a master of one so that you specialize in that so that people will come to you for that one specialization in the fintech space uh, rather than you know uh, you spend all your time just reading stuff which because there's a lot of constant changes that's happening that's and that's my advice to everyone True. Gunjit, ma'am, what is your advice for our young lawyers? Okay, so my advice really is that, first of all, so you've chosen to be a lawyer. So three things you must have: you must have patience, because it's the profession itself has a long gestation period. Two, you must be a person who loves to read. because read you must for the next 30 40 years of your career if you don't like reading maybe this is not even a profession for you and the third is that you must have great research skills if these three qualities you don't have then there is going to be a problem in a profession like this not only in the fintech side but in any field of law because reading an ability to write to research is just mandatory it is like you know a doctor needs his stethoscope you need these skills if you want to be a lawyer in any field not only fintech you choose any field so be very careful that if you have these if you love this then you can be a lawyer now once you've decided that yes you do have all this then now you want to be a lawyer then you decide what kind of a lawyer do you want to be like shrijit said jack of all trades or a master and master of none or master of one then you choose so yes you can be a part uh, consider fintech like a wheel and you could be a cog in that wheel where you say that my input for example for us uh, as a firm we are a cog in the really big corporate wheel so if you know the corporate lawyers do all the you know due diligences and mergers and everything and we just put in our ip perspective in it on what needs to be done and what needs to go and what need so just the ip is protected so we are a cog in a very big commercial wheel from ip perspective so either you could be that if you intend to be a full wheel um my experience says it's going to be difficult but it's not uh, impossible 
it will all depend on whether uh, you want to be uh, going that path where you have a little knowledge of everything. So, you know, you have a broad overview of this, but still every time a client comes to you and says, hey, you know, I want to start a fintech business, give me a holistic advice. You will have to pull in the experts in every cog in that wheel. So, you know, it's uh, actually going to be a personal choice. That was very insightful, ma'am. So I'm sure our young lawyers must be thinking about their careers in fintech and they are excited to be part of our fintech industry. So uh, now I would like to open the stage for the question and answer session. So um, any of the participants who have any questions, they can just drop down in the text box. We would like to answer, maybe would like to take five questions. Srijit, I think we scared them and. <laughs> so I agree. Know, it's very satisfying. I must also add this. You know, I I personally, uh, it's my 23rd year in the profession and I still love it. So it's not that that you need to be scared, but yes, yeah, it does require a lot of patience. It really does, of course. So uh, obviously it's, it's been more than 15 years for me. And I'm still learning. It's 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 a new thing for me every day. Correct. Uh, I, I, so I think the chat chat channel is not open for everyone. Maybe that's why you're not getting questions. Uh, but you might just check that. Okay. Uh, Saloni or Manya, can you just help me how to open this chat box? Maybe uh, if anyone is interested, they can raise their hand as well. So yeah. Uh, Dr. Prakriti has raised their hand. Yeah, you are allowed to speak now. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. It's a very in insightful presentation, sir. So my question is, what the role of an authority, uh, regulatory authority in, in regarding that uh, problem, sir? Uh, regarding what problem, ma'am? In, in, I mean to say regulatory property authority in regards to the yeah, fintech business yeah, or? Yeah, uh, yeah that, that problem only, sir. Uh, Sorry, your voice was breaking, but let, let me just try to answer that. Uh, depends on which regulatory authority you're talking about. Uh, you have SEBI, which is regulating the securities exchange. You have uh, RBI, which is regulating all the other fintech business for now. Uh, you have UPI guidelines and PCI I'm, guidelines. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about SEBI, SEBI sir, Security Exchange Board of India. Yeah, of course. So SEBI is the is the main regulator, right? So all the SEBI guidelines you'll have to follow when you're doing a fintech business. If it's if it's in their ambit, uh, when I say if it's in their ambit, it's because uh, fintech covers a large uh, industry area. It also covers your online payment gateways. It uh, it still covers your uh, you know e-commerce players. It so when it comes to SEBI, it's restricted to. Uh, people doing mutual funds uh, online or uh, doing uh, you know market transactions online so most of that comes under sebi purview and obviously as uh, regulators you'll have to you'll have to uh, comply with the laws they have and uh, they are the watchdogs so if you breach any law they're going to come catch you no, nothing more on that thank you sir thank you So next is uh, Ms. Kritika. You can ask your question. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Kritika and I'm currently a law student, second year law student from UPA. So like uh, currently I'm in my second year and I've been trying to explore various aspects of law and like it gets a bit difficult for me to 
segregate what I am best inclined towards or what my keen interests are. So, like right recently, I was studying about IP, and now I attended the session regarding importance of IP and fintech. So, like my question is, how do we actually get to know whether we are actually up for it and we are fully inclined towards it? For example, like IP for that matter, or fintech. Uh, me being a fintech lawyer. Ma'am, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, Kritika, uh, experience is all that matters, right? So, sabse pehle to maine bola because I understand that you guys are students and you know you get like one semester or one subject which actually doesn't really teach you much because they are just scraping the uh, you know top layer and every field of law is going very deep in. So what I would recommend is that the first three qualities which I've already said, if you have a lawyer, you should have research skills. You should like to read. You should be a person who loves reading. Long, long hours uh, should not be a problem for you because every lawyer will have to work long hours, etc. So once you feel that your personality is geared to be a lawyer, then you start taking very, very mindfully, you select your internships. I would think that when you are going for an internship, don't look at it from a perspective where you're only saying that a certificate will get or everything Because you're not there for the certificate. Your certificate as a um, as the managing partner at ZSIP, I can tell you that you know when I get a resume and it says 20 internships, it doesn't really say much to me, right? It's not something that uh, it's not something that I actually factor in before uh, you know we do the hiring for the firm. So what you need to do is that you should consider, and this is for everyone in the audience, you should consider your internships exactly th this, what Kritika is saying, that an experience to see whether you even like it. So please feel free if you are interning with a firm to actually you know, go to your seniors or whoever is handling the interns, uh, the person, and say that I need to do the work. You know. What I feel most of the students do, they come, um, they are not showing any interest in actually learning the hands on job. They are there only to get a certificate. So, you know, most of the firms also kind of leave them alone. They'll give them a research project and, you know, they'll be sitting in some corner doing the research project. They'll be coming for 15 days, getting a certificate, and you're done. But that's not something that you should be looking at. Uh, you should not be looking at just gathering certificates. You should be looking at actually doing a hands on job. So please feel free to keep going to your seniors saying that I want to help you tell me I, you know, uh, you know, even if you're doing a project and you think I can't do it, just give it to me and then, you know, let me also kind of uh, get my juices going and I'll present you something. Maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't like it, but I, I don't know how successful you will be at firms, but your idea, your mindset when you're doing an internship should be to learn. So while you can ask for work, you can ask, um, you know, find a senior who's having lunch or coffee and just have a chat with them, ask them questions that, you know, they're happy to answer, etc. The idea is that you need to have this experience to actually confirm and check with yourself whether IP is meant for you or whether FinTech is good for you. Do you even enjoy it? Do you like it, etc. So I would think that you have to very mindfully pick. Uh, your uh, internships and just make sure that you make the best use of your internship and don't just think of it as a, you know, it's a certificate gathering exercise. Thank you, ma'am. So next question we have from Anita Mishra. So Miss Anita, you can ask your question. Anita, are you are you on mute? <coughs> Am I audible now? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So this is um, regarding these uh, WhatsApp messages that we receive regarding a loan that uh, you no know, people have never taken, and they want uh, them to pay it. So this is a very, this is a financial transaction which has never happened. What, what, which law are these people breaching? And if we want to complain, where do we go? As in, 
this is what is this ip or criminal or don't know what is this actually because they are breaching so many things i can't hear you ma'am i'll let srijit answer that sure thank you so hey anita the main thing uh what they are breaching is rbi guidelines mainly and because they are breaching rbi guidelines you are going into uh, a criminal act done by others siphoning of money obviously so uh, the basic thing here is uh, under rbi guidelines there are very specific uh, rules for people to give loan only banks or nbfcs can give loans and uh, the bfsi space that is banking and finance space and uh, your buy now pay later options these are all being uh, yes, closely watched by rbi and uh, if you see after these complaints came up uh, they found out that is mostly chinese companies which were doing it uh, and they were uh, they were actually be uh, rbi has very strongly taken it against uh, other companies and uh, you see all the news coming in for blocking of pay, prepaid cards they've uh, stopped companies from using uh, prepaid cards as credit cards so these changes have come in the last 3 months after this news has come and that's the speed at which the regulator is actually working right now and uh, that's how rbi is blocking people from uh, sending such messages obviously reported first to the uh, police reported to the cyber crime cell and obviously obviously uh, they'll take it up with the, uh, with the relevant companies which are doing it and uh, companies are doing this are actually breaching rbi laws that's the main act which they are breaching thank you thank you shrijit so uh, the next question is by rishi raj hello yeah so my question was mainly towards like uh, towards ip and fintech towards the world of ip and fintech the main problem and issues come near uh, with ip and fintech comes near cross border activity and open source coding so like patenting that is the main uh, like patent infringement which occur a patent protection granted towards that becomes a problem so like understanding it from the indian indian patent act perspective how can like what are the steps necessary for patent protection of in these two areas so um वेरी क्विकली और दो लाइन में अगर मैं आपको एडवाइस दूँ तो अगर आपने ओपन सोर्स यूज किया है तो ऑब्वियसली वो पैटेंटेबल नहीं है आप ओपन सोर्स यूज करके कुछ और बना सकते हैं विच कुड बी पैटेंटेबल सो अगेन योर आई पी लॉयर इज गोइंग टू एंड पैटेंट एक्सपर्ट इज गोइंग टू बी एडवाइजिंग यू ऑन दैट एज फार एज क्रॉस बॉर्डर एक्टिविटी इज कंसर्न पैटेंटिंग इज अ वेरी जूरिस्टिक्शनल आई पी राइट तो अगर आप 12 कंट्रीज में अपना बिजनेस कर रहे हैं तो आपको अपना पैटेंट 12 कंट्रीज में ही रजिस्टर करना पड़ेगा does that answer your question is that the question you are asking actually uh yeah so i was uh, reading more about how open source protection has come across since pro like uh, companies like linux and everything have like uh, come with uh, open source protection where they, they have merged with banks and all so like the main problem these uh, like industry, the main problem these uh, companies face are how do you uh, how do you patent the software which is based on like like an open source code and that was more or less my question so thank you thank you rishi so as we are running out of time i would like to take one last question for the day miss ayushi you can ask my question please hello good morning um so my question is to gunjan ma'am so gunjan ma'am i would like to know uh, what is the story behind zeus ip and how did it came to picture like how did it come to life so yes because you're the founder of zeus ip right so i'd like okay. to know how did it come to life yes okay so this is like a you know i graduated from law school in 1999 right so it's been 22 years okay uh, but the आप लोगों को ये समझ नहीं आएगी क्योंकि अब जमाना बहुत बदल गया है बट यू नो वेन आई ग्रेजुएटेड फ्रॉम लॉ स्कूल आई वर्क विद आई पी फॉर्म एक्सेट्रा 
उस जमाने में ये एक यू नो प्रॉब्लम हुआ करती थी दैट मोस्ट फर्म्स इन द कंट्री वर फैमिली रन एंड फैमिली ओन्ड सो यू नो इफ यू वर अ लॉयर हु वाज वर्किंग एट अ फर्म हु वाज नॉट अ फैमिली मेंबर एटसेट्रा देयर वाज वेरी वेरी फ्यू पीपल हु एक्चुअली मेड इट टू द पार्टनर लेवल बिकॉज़ द टेंडेंसी 20 इयर्स अगो आई डोंट इवन नो whether you were you know i don't know 2 years old or maybe i don't know so you no, guys no, i was in born Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't even born. So 22 years ago, this country looked like that. If you, you know, if you were a family member, then you would become uh, the owner of the firm, or you would become a partner at the firm. But if you were not a family member, then there would be uh, no growth, so to speak. Yes, ma'am. So the, you know, the firm, I, I, the GSIP is based on the fundamental that you know to give a platform to lawyers. who don't have a family background of law who don't have a you know they have a family name but they still want to do good work and uh, and i don't see why only merit should be rewarded in any profession including law and if you're good at what you do and i don't see why you should not be rewarded and awarded for it why should you always be mid managerial in any law firm why can't you become you know partner level decision making positions or even owners at some point so gsip was actually founded on those principles uh, but thankfully and it's good to know that the world has changed now and the firms are also opening up their partnerships to non family members so yes uh, you are entering the field in a very good phase than uh, what it was 20 years ago Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I would also like to ask that what is it that uh, uh, basically partners look for in the uh, uh, students who apply for internships? Like, what what is the core criteria on which you select the interns? See, I can't tell you what other law firms do or what other partners at other law firms do. I can only give you from what my experience is. Honestly speaking. uh very rarely do we see a intern that we really like and whoever we've liked we've always offered assessment internship which is a much longer internship period with the idea to test them out a little more before we offer them a full time job um but i you know i i hate to say it but unfortunately it is true that it happens only to say 1 or 2% of the interns that come in uh in the firm as far as giving internships which is like 15 days or 20 days i don't think any of the partners even looks at the internship requests we just have slots and our hr department looks at okay you know we have four slots for interns and whoever has applied we kind of offer them the internships people come they work for 15 days two weeks three weeks four weeks whatever their internship looks like and then they go um there are very few um interns who actually grab your eyeballs and get your attention to say that oh my god this one's really good and she's interested or he's interested and you know this is a person that i would like to kind of see a little more that is when we offer a second internship or we offer an internship but the percentage of it is low because my perception of the new law students is that they are here to collect a certificate not really learn law and that's a problem and i i don't take it otherwise don't feel bad uh what i'm saying is that each one of you is responsible for your own career so just make sure and it it shouldn't be about the firm it's internship is about you so you have to be yes, very mindful you have to get the things done you have to learn the law you have to understand whether you like what you do i mean you can't be expecting your um, law firm to actually take interest in ki you know aap lawyer banna chahte hain thank you very much and you know we are going to make you lawyers nobody can make you a good lawyer only you can make yourself a good lawyer so keep that focus and it's all about you you have to decide because whatever you decide in your internships and if you choose a particular area whether you choose corporate whether you choose civil or criminal or corporate or ip or whatever you choose um i'm not saying you can't change later i mean it happens that people work for 3 years in corporate and then decide they don't like it and they move that happens all the time that's not a problem but be mindful that if you choose and you choose right then you're going to be doing it for the next 30 40 years because that's the average lifespan of a lawyer of a like a lawyer's career so you have to be very yes, sure that you actually enjoy what you're doing and for that internships are important otherwise you can obviously always experiment with life you can 
pick up a job at a corporate firm, decide in a year or two that you don't like it, switch, whatever. I mean, it's your life. You can do whatever you want with it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So that was very honest opinion. <laughs> So let's move forward. Before concluding the session, I would like to inform that uh, OIP Press has come up with a specialized course on IP and FinTech that is starting from August 20th. So please register for that and you can check out the course through the link in the chat box. Maybe Mana can share the link with you. To register, maybe you can visit www.theipress.com. To conclude the session, I would like to thank everyone for this wonderful and informative session. It was a delight to have you with us today. And um, I would like to extend my heartful gratitude to Ms. Kunjan and Mr. Shijit for giving us their valuable time. We could not have a, had a better speaker for this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now. <laughs> Also, I would like to thank all the attendees for making this session a fun and interactive one. Thank you, everyone. Have a fun Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.